Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Before we begin with our prayer and our presentation, I just wanted to make an announcement. Uh, if we have our volunteers in the back, uh, we're going to be passing out to everybody here, uh, one per family, uh, our prayer intentions. And I think we had our volunteers in the back there somewhere. Okay, if we could stand up and have you guys go down the rows. We're going to be sending you with a card. And basically it is, you could just pass them right down the row. Try to do maybe one per family. And it's a perforated prayer card that has the image of Jesus, the divine mercy. And first of all, can everybody hear me in the back? Can you all hear me? Okay. So it's perforated. It has a prayer card. Jesus said, I want the image of divine mercy in every home. But on the second part is a beautiful opportunity for you guys to fill out a prayer intention. And we will take your prayer intention back with us to the shrine of divine mercy and place it near the altar and have a mass said over your intention. Now, you do not have to put your name or your address. You do not have to do that. If you don't feel you want to do that, that is absolutely fine. You don't even have to take the card, but if you want to put an anonymous intention, that is fine. However, if you do put your name and address, we will add you to our prayer list, pray for you every day. Oh, that's a reminder for me to take my heart medicine. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a stent uh, put in. I had 95% blockage in my main artery. I learned they call it the widow maker. I, I don't have to worry about that, though. Um, but anyway, if you have um, an opportunity to put your attention, if you do put your name and address, we'll add you to our prayer list, and we will pray for you every day, and by decree of the Holy See, you will receive all the graces of our masses, prayers, rosaries, penances, just like you were a member of the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. That's a gift by what we were given since we are called a spiritual benefit society, okay? But it's up to you uh, if you want to do that. And at the end of the night, we'll be passing around a basket and you could just throw these in there if you completed them. Or you know what? Take them home, do them, and bring them back tomorrow. Or you can even mail them in, okay? So no biggie there. Um, we'll be passing around the basket at the end. So I tell you what, you could go ahead, and if my talk is boring, you could be texting, and I'll be thinking you're filling out my prayer card. So, so very good. So everybody, let's uh, begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Mother of Mercy, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. What we're going to do to give you an idea is we're going to do uh, one talk, uh, about 40 minutes. We'll take a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back and do a second talk and finish right at 8.30. So hopefully with that break in between, you'll be able to go. If you need to leave earlier, please just go. That is not a problem for me. But we'll do one talk, take a break. And then we'll stretch, move around, go to the bathroom, and then we'll come back, second talk, and then we'll be out of here by 8.30, okay? So that'll be the format that we'll do. Hopefully we'll even finish a little earlier, if that is possible. Okay, so everybody, what we're going to do tonight is we first, you see on your screen there, is the Shrine of Divine Mercy. Now, that looks like a really nice place, doesn't it, from the, uh, from the air, it does, but actually, I've lived there for several years, and it's actually in quite need of repair. I haven't had heat for two years, and it does get mighty cold in the Brookshires. But anyway, this is a beautiful place to be. It's the epicenter of God's mercy. Why are the Marian fathers of the Immaculate Conception the ones in charge of divine mercy when we don't even have mercy in our title? 
We are called the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. And everybody always asks, how come you are the priests that have all the um, efforts in spreading divine mercy? And the answer is because Mary's Immaculate Conception is God's greatest act of mercy ever bestowed on a creature. And they go hand in hand. So we're going to talk about that tonight. As I mentioned at one of the masses, you might recognize some of our well-known priests, Father Michael Gately, my best friend. He's done 33 days to morning glory. Some of you may have done it here, consecration to Mary. Or Father Don Calloway, who's got one of the greatest conversion stories. You know, I thought I had a rough past until I heard Father Don Calloway's story. Holy mackerel. If you haven't heard that, there's a, a story out there called No Turning Back. But anyway, this is who we are. Now, before I flip the slide, people always come up to us and they say, Father, you're just preaching to the choir. When you guys come, you guys are the ones that have faith. You are the ones that believe in God. You are the ones that try to make mass. Father, why aren't you out on the streets preaching to the homeless or the atheist? And actually, we do do that. But my particular assignment is to do this, to go around to parishes. I've been to 100, I think it's, this is 138th parish that I visited, and we are doing the Jesus model, and that is we are teaching the teachers. So you guys are the teachers that in the next three nights I want to teach and tell you what this is all about. So that's why we're here, not to preach to the choir, but like Jesus, he taught the teachers so that they could go teach. All right, very good. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about who the Marians are. This is a very short video clip. It's only a minute long. But this will give you an idea. I said in the Mass, if you don't think divine mercy is important, ask God. Because he keeps sending us more and more and more men. We've run out of room. We are completely full. We're trying to build a new monastery. We are turning men away. That tells you that God's message of mercy is important and he wants it out there. There's only one problem. Every time we hear an announcement that 12 more guys are coming, everybody says, rejoice. I cry because I'm in charge of fundraising. <laughs> so um, I'm not as excited as some of the others. But God bless all of you for praying for us mainly. But I want to show a short video clip to give you an idea of who we are. needs holy priests. Men who will sacrifice everything for the greater glory of God and the salvation of souls. What attracts so many men to the Marians is that we are Orthodox, Marian, Eucharistic, and Apostles of Divine Mercy. Our men belong entirely to Mary. We are honored to bear her name three times in our official title. The Mary Father of the Immaculate Conception of the Most Blessed Virgin Mary. They want to be holy priests. Help them answer the Lord's call. Please support our Marian seminarians. So the point that I want to make there is, not, don't worry about supporting our seminarians. We pray to God to do that. But we ask for your prayers because these men are giving their lives to do this message of divine mercy. And you've never seen anything like it. We are getting the best of the best. We are getting guys from all over the United States. We're getting the most orthodox, conservative guys right out of the heart of Cal Southern California right out of the East Coast, which is a bedrock of liberal uh, area, and we're getting the best of the best. So we ask for your prayers first and foremost. Okay, so let us begin. Now, when we come to the Marians, basically all Marians, when we come to interview with our, our priests, when, we, when I came to the, to the community, they asked us this question. So if you're ever going to become a priest, and you, become, you come to the Marian Fathers, they're going to ask you this question. Who is Jesus to you? Now, 
answers here, if I was to ask all of you, would vary. But for the most part, I think everybody would agree he is God, right? Now, we all want to be like him here on earth. In order to do that, to be like Jesus, we need something. And the number one thing you need is virtue. Y'all remember your catechism? Y'all remember the cardinal virtues? Well, I'm going to remind you. Let's go through them. The cardinal virtues are these four. Temperance, that's just simply moderation. You know, I heard a sentence once that one little sentence helped me lose 17 pounds. Now, sadly, I've put 14 of those 17 back on. But that sentence that I lost 17 pounds was simply never hungry, never full. That was it. Just little meals throughout the day, grazing, not stuffing yourself like a chicken or a turkey. You are simply moderation, right? Now, what's the next one? Justice. Justice means eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? Of course not. Justice means giving someone their due. Do you know when you come to Mass on Sunday, religion falls under justice? Why does religion fall under justice? Because you're giving God his due. Worship. Very important. Prudence. Oh, man, there's a good one for me. Every time I look back at the trouble I've caused myself in life, 100% of it is because I didn't think before I spoke. And fortitude, courage. Do we need courage to be Catholic today? Oh, holy mackerel. I've heard stories you can't believe. You know, stories about people in public where they see priests in collars. I've got my own stories. You know, a woman in a grocery store, uh, you know, looking at a priest who just smiles at her little kid, grabbing that child and saying, don't you ever look at my child like that again. These are hard things, and we have to be courageous, fortitude, to be Catholic today. Now, when do you get, oops, excuse me, I just went too far ahead. These virtues called the cardinal virtues, you get through your own effort. You know how you acquire these? Practice. But there are three greater virtues. Do you all remember your catechism? They're called the theological virtues, and these are not given through your own practice, but at your baptism. And they are faith, hope, and the greatest of these is love. All right, now, if you could also pick one word that could describe God, what is that one word? It also is love. So who is Jesus? Jesus is God, and God is love. But why love? Okay? Love is what? Most people think it's an emotion. Love is not an emotion. Contrary to the world telling you so. Love is willing the good of the other person. And God always wills what's good for us. So, Love is giving yourself completely to the other. Love isn't about you making me feel good. Oh, therefore, I love you. Love is giving yourself completely to the other. Love is not an emotion. You know, I'll give you an example. My knucklehead brother-in-law. What a knucklehead. For 24 years, he was married to my sister. He was a facade. He was carrying on a long-term affair with another woman. Finally, he ended the marriage with my sister. My sister was beyond devastated. And he came in and he told her one day the reason he was getting a divorce was because he no longer feels or sees the fireworks when she walks in the room. Now, after 24 years of marriage, if you still see fireworks every time your spouse walks in the room, you could be a case study. Okay? That is not how it works. Emotions go like this. If you, emotions are a roller coaster. If you're going to bail ship every time the emotion goes down, you're never going to make it. Emotion is not the basis of love. It plays parts, 
But love is a decision. It's an act of the will. I choose to love you no matter what. Does a parent feel like changing a dirty diaper at 2 in the morning? Ah, I don't think so. But you do it because you love that child. You know, my best employee at the shrine, I have 85 employees that work for me at the shrine. 85. And, man, you talk about herding cats. That is difficult. But one of my best employees is Zeke. And Zeke was, had his first child, and it was Anna, a little girl, beautiful. But she cried for a year. She never stopped crying. And his wife was telling me the story. She said, Father Chris, thank you for being so patient with Zeke. He, he was a zombie. And she said one night she walked in at 2 in the morning, and Anna is just screaming. It's a work night. And Zeke has got her in his right arm, and he's rocking on the rocker. And he's holding her in his right arm, and he's exhausted. And he's patting the air with his left hand. <laughs> You see, love is a decision. I choose to love you. Do you think he felt like being up at 2 in the morning, patting the air? No. And the same with my sister, with my brother-in-law. He didn't feel it, but yet he abandoned ship. He made a commitment to her, and he didn't see through it. You know, my sister is a beautiful Christian. I wish I could be half of what my sister is. Do you know my, um, my, my brother-in-law left my sister for that woman? And I'll tell you the kind of Christian my sister is. And I could only wish I could be half of what she is. And the, my sister left, excuse me, my brother-in-law left. And the woman he left with, they, they ended up moving in together. And they were having an argument one day at a railroad at the stop waiting for a train to go by. And they were the only car there and they were arguing and she jumped out of the car and laid in front of the train. It literally cut her in half and my sister told me the story, and my sister prays for her every single day. And my sister really, really is devoted to praying for this woman. Here's a woman that ruined her marriage, and yet she is praying every day for her. Now, that is a Christian. So this is what love is, right? The ultimate love, however, is what? Laying down your life for another. So the ultimate love is Jesus dying for us, right? Okay, so we are focused here on love for one minute. Now, of all the virtues, if I could stack all the virtues on this floor, fortitude, justice, patience, faith, hope, if I could stack all of them, even patience, if I could stack all the virtues on this floor, what's the highest virtue? We just said it, love, all right? So love is the greatest virtue of all. Now, is all love the same? Uh-uh. Now, I'm a graduate of the University of Michigan, and sometimes I run into Ohio State fans that see me at the airport because I got my Michigan thing, right? And um, I love Michigan football. I absolutely love it. When I came to the Marians and they asked if I had any special requests, I actually said, yes, I do, Father. Can I watch Michigan football in the fall? They were like, we've never had that kind of request before. But the bottom line is I love Michigan football, but do I love Michigan football the same way I love my mother? She probably would say yes. <laughs> but of course not. The greatest mode of the greatest virtue. Okay, let's look at this. Of all the virtues, the greatest is love. And of all the modes of love, there's loving ice cream, there's loving your pet, then there's loving your wife and your mother and your father. Of all the modes of love, the greatest mode is mercy. Mercy is the highest form of the highest virtue. You cannot do better. It's the highest form of the highest virtue. What is mercy? Mercy is a particular mode of love that when love encounters suffering, it takes action to do something about it. When God saw Adam and Eve get broken in the garden, what did he promise? A savior. This is God's response to suffering. Our suffering, God's response. This is what mercy is. Now let's go on a little farther. Father Kosicki, God rest him soul, he said, 
Mercy is having pains in your heart for the pains of another, just like God did with us, and taking pains to do something about their pain. This is very powerful. So if we go back, this is what Jesus did. He took pains because of our pain. So this is what divine mercy is. Now, I love this image. Can everybody see this? I tell you, I have been that man with that hammer, driving those nails into Jesus' hands and feet. This continues what mercy is. You see, mercy is loving the unlovable and forgiving the unforgivable. We are both unlovable and we are both unforgivable. All of us here are unlovable and unforgivable. Yet God still loves us and still forgives us. Because we are unlovable and because we are unforgivable, we suffer. And God wants to do something about our suffering. He sent his son. This is divine mercy. All right, now, God wants to do something about it. Now, you see what that is? That is our shrine of divine mercy in Stockbridge. We just filmed a new rendition of the Chaplet of Divine Mercy. It'll be coming out soon at EWTN. But because we are suffering, we need religion. You know, we need religion to help us find God and to heal. But have you ever heard this? Eh, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. You ever hear that? I'm not into organized religion. Really? Jesus was into organized religion. We're going to talk about this on Tuesday. You see, Jesus appointed the first bishops, gave them the power to forgive sins. He set up Peter as the head of the church in the Pope, and he gave us the magisterium and the hierarchy to give us complete, clear vision on the way to heaven. Jesus organized religion. But if you're like my own family... Eh, it doesn't matter what religion you are as long as you're something. Oh, really? Hmm. I can prove to you right now. Now, not every religion believes God is a trinity. Some religions believe God is not a trinity. Islam doesn't believe in the trinity. Um, Mormons don't believe in the trinity. You can go on and on. But I can prove to you right now, God has to be a trinity. Why is that? Okay. We all said a minute ago that if we could pick one word that describes God, what would that one word be? Love. All right? Now, we have one God or three gods? I actually had somebody yell out three. We have one God, three persons. Now, I have a question for you. If I'm the only person who ever existed, none of you ever existed, only me, can there be love? No. In order to have love, you need a lover, you need the beloved, and you need the love between them. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the Trinity. You have God the Father, the lover. You have the Son, the beloved. And the love between them is so great that proceeds from them a third person, the Holy Spirit. God has to be a trinity. It can be no other way. Augustine said this. Now, what's this? Now, I'm not here to open up a political barnstorm, but I do want to make this point. The family is a mirror of the trinity. You have the father, the lover, the wife, the beloved, and the love between them is so great, it generates a third person, the child. Please don't beat the daylights out of your church because your church is the last religion standing, for the most part, that preaches this is a mirror of the Trinity. That doesn't mean two men can't love each other. Of course they can. Two women can love each other, of course they can. I love Father Michael Gately, but you can better believe there is no genital contact. 
Love is by our society now defined as genital contact. That is the definition of love on everything now coming out of the government. This is not the definition of love. You see, love is the fruit that can bear when the lover unites with the beloved and the love between them generates so great a love that another person results from it. You can only have that in this mirror of the Trinity. That's why the three objectives of marriage, all you spouses out there tonight, what are your three objectives to marriage? When you got married and you go before the Lord, he is going to ask you how you did on your three objectives of marriage. And what are they? Anybody? <laughs> One, procreative, open to life. You are procreative, you are open to life. Again, I'm not going to open up a can of worms, but this is why the church is always taught against contraception. Contraception is saying, I love you so much, but I'm not going to give myself entirely to you. In fact, I love you, but I don't love you enough that I want another one like you in the world. That's what contraception says. It blocks me from giving myself entirely to you. So you see, one objective of marriage is procreation. What's the next one? Well, procreation, go, children go under there with the education. That's all part of that. Two is unitive, that you share in the marital act and renew the covenant. And three, you're all doing it right here if you're here together with your spouse. Get your spouse to heaven. Those are the three objectives of marriage. So if your spouse had to give you the elbow tonight to get you to come here, they're doing their job. To get your spouse to heaven is the third objective of marriage. This is what marriage is. When it's so powerful, it can become another person. This is the power of marriage. And this is how the church defines it. All right. Now, let's go on to another topic here. Before I flip the slide, I want to give you four years of seminary in four minutes. Okay? Hang with me. By the way, you're getting a, usually four different presentations you're getting in one night tonight. So sorry if I'm trying to cram 10 pounds of bacon in a two-pound bag. But I think you'll get the gist of it. Now, I wasn't till I was third year major seminary that I realized what our faith was all about. And it came from Thomas Aquinas, great saint. And do you know our entire faith can be summarized by a circle? Did you all know that? I'm going to give you the only Latin you're going to get tonight, but it's called exitus reditus. All comes from God. All will return to God. It's a circle. This is the entire Summa Theologica of Thomas Aquinas. Our whole faith is a circle. Now, in that faith is mercy. The three great acts of God's mercy define that circle. You can't have anything else at the forefront of our faith than God's mercy. Here's how it goes. The first great act of mercy, remember I said all comes from God, all will return to God. The first great act of mercy, who we normally attribute to the first person of the Trinity, if all comes from God, what do you think the first great act of mercy is? All comes from God. Creation, excellent. The first great act of God's mercy is creation. The love of the Trinity overflowed outside of itself and made us, right? Right? The love of the Trinity overflowed outside of itself when we got the first great act of mercy. This is creation. Normally, the first great act of mercy attributed to the first person of the Trinity, creation. Now, Father Seraphim, our world's foremost expert on divine mercy, was challenged by a Jesuit. And the Jesuit said, how dare you say creation is mercy? 
That's not mercy. Mercy is relieving the suffering. And if you don't even exist, you can't suffer. And Father Seraphim, wow. God bless him. He pulled out Thomas Aquinas. You know what Thomas Aquinas said? The greatest misery is not to exist. That's the greatest misery. Remember, Shakespeare, to be or not to be is the greatest misery. Not to exist is the greatest misery. So when God created us, we had the greatest first act of mercy. Well, wait a minute. If that's the greatest misery, what the heck do you call this? This is evil, isn't it? You know what evil is? Evil's not a real thing. Oh, Father, what have you been smoking? Evil is not a real thing. That would mean God created it. Satan, the father of evil, did God create him? Oh, yeah, he did. Oh, you got me there. No. Did God create Satan ontologically evil? Or was Satan created good? He was created good. He was the highest of the angels. And when he fell and took the other angels with him, it was his choosing to turn away from God. You know what evil is? Evil is defined as good not existing. Evil is simply a privation of the good. So when we take God out of something, that's what results in evil. Evil is not a created thing by God. God can't create something contrary to his nature. So God created all things good. What does Genesis say? He created the world and called it good. God can't create evil. It goes contrary to his nature. That's why God can't hate you. People say, well, God hates me. God couldn't have created you if he hated you. So you see, this is important. When we pull God out of something, this is what evil is. In fact, you can go one step further. God is goodness itself, is he not? When we pull goodness out, which is God himself, what's left is evil. When you pull God out of the courts, and God is goodness itself, so a privation of the good is evil. You pull God out of the courts, what's left is evil. Pull God out of your family, I'm telling you, you're going to go through exactly what my sister went through. Because my brother-in-law had no relationship with God. You pull God out of the schools, this is what you get. This is what you get. You know, there's a shirt out there. Maybe you've seen it. The shirt says, Columbine, Sandy Hook. You know what those are? School shootings, right? And the shirt says, God, how can you let this happen in our schools? And you know what it says after that? God, quote, I'm not allowed in your schools. Isn't that a great statement? This is why, and it took, of all people after this Florida shooting, it took an NFL football player to stand up and say, this is not going to be fixed by another law. Now I'm here again not to open up the gun debate law, but this is not going to be fixed with another gun law. He said, when are we going to realize it's time to put God back in the schools? That's the only fix. You know, we don't know if we're near the end or not, but God in Scripture tells us the end will come when what is good is called evil and what is evil will be called good. We're seeing that right now. The church which is good is called evil, hates people's rights, stomps on them, forces its will, and what is evil, like abortion, is called good, women's rights. So you see, these are the things. And Mother or, uh, Sister Lucy from Fatima said, the final battle between God and Satan will be over marriage and the family. And we're seeing that today. All right? What did Jesus say? Pope Benedict, sorry, sorry what did Pope Benedict say? Only divine mercy is able to impose limitations on evil. Only the almighty love of God can defeat the tyranny of the wicked and the destructive power of selfishness and hate. Not the church. She is not the hater. The church is not a hater. And we'll explain that more on Tuesday. 
Only divine mercy can put the limitations on real hate. That is evil, the lack of the good. All right, now, as I said, not more laws are going to fix this. Again, I'm not here to debate gun control, but I will make this comment. My father's 77 years old. And my father said when he was in high school, Catholic high school, they would all bring their guns to school. I said, what? He said, yeah, we kept them in our lockers. I said, are you insane? He said, no, we all did because we all went pheasant hunting after school. <laughs> you know how many shootings they had in the United States, in the history of the United States of America before 1997? Zero. They had guns in lockers and never had a single school shooting. Now, my dad also went part to public school. They did the same thing there. They had guns in their lockers. They would go hunting after school. But you know what else? They had God in the schools. My dad said at that public school, every day to start the day, they prayed from the Bible. At lunch, they said the prayer over the food. And at the end of the day, they said the Lord's Prayer. Public school in the 1950s. And there wasn't a single school shooting. I'm just saying. Okay, let's get back to Exitus Reditus. The first great act of God's mercy is creation. Now what happened? Adam and Eve, we got broken. The second great act of mercy is redemption. First great act of mercy, creation. We fell, we got broken. God did something about it when he saw our suffering, sent his son, redemption. How funny, Tom Petty, huh? <laughs> redemption comes to those who wait. Forgiveness is the key. So the second great act of mercy by the second person of the Trinity, redemption. Now, in the third, and the final, and the greatest act of mercy. Now we're getting ready to go back to God the Father. The third act of mercy by guess who? The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Sanctification. God's will for your life is your sanctification. This is the third great act of mercy. Now I have a question for you. When does your sanctification happen? Some people say at your baptism, that's very true. You are divinized in the East. They call sanctification divinization. You share in the divine life of God. Some people say when you die and you enter into the beatific vision, that is very true as well. But where does it happen every minute of every day somewhere around the world? Everybody? The Mass. This is downtown Detroit, my hometown. This is St. Albertus, one of the most beautiful churches you've ever seen, downtown Detroit. Detroit has some of the most beautiful churches you've ever seen. This is St. Albertus, and I was there doing a mission and was blown away when I explained to the people what the Mass is. This is what we're going to finish before our break. The Mass is God offering God to God. This is our faith, right? Now, when we got created, we all come to Mass, we're creatures. We got broken. Jesus came down and redeemed us. Now what happens at the Mass? Jesus, in his redemption of us, is taking us back to God the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Mass is God offering God to God. God the Holy Spirit offering God the Son in sacrifice to God the Father for atonement for our sins and for our sanctification. The Mass is this. But wait a minute, Father. No, it isn't. It's some priest. He's a man up there, and that man ain't even holy. And then the church is bigots because they won't even ordain women. But the church has no authority to ordain women. Again, I, now I really don't want to open up a can of worms. But the church is not sexist. No offense to any diocesan priest. But what's a higher calling? A diocesan priest or a cloistered nun? 
a cloistered nun. A cloistered nun is a higher calling than a diocesan priest. They live the three vows. What three vows do every religious take? Poverty or chastity and obedience. Why do we take those three vows? The three gods of the world, with a little g, are sex, money, and power. To counteract the god of the world of sex, we take the vow of chastity. To counteract the god of the world of money, we take the vow of poverty. To counteract the god of the world of power, we take the vow of obedience. This is why the church is not sexist. In fact, who was the greatest creature who ever lived besides Jesus? And he was not a creature. He had a human nature. But who was the greatest created creature who ever lived? Mary. Was she a priest? No, she wasn't. She wasn't even the head of the holy family. Joseph was. Yet she's the greatest creature God ever made. It's not about sexism. It's, it's about equality but difference. This is why this whole gender confusion thing, not to open up another can of worms, <laughs> but if Satan can confuse the very essence of your entire being, your maleness or femaleness, there is nothing more staple to your existence than your maleness or your femaleness. If Satan can confuse that, he can confuse anything. If he can confuse the very fact of who you are as a human being, anything is up for grabs. This is the danger in that. It's not free rights. It's confusion of our very identity that God created us. So, let's go on here. All right, this is what I want to finish before the break. Now, if I was to ask you guys, when you were married, some of you would say September 4th, 1978, whatever that date might be. And you say, Father, that was the day I was married. But you know your ultimate wedding will be in heaven. Do you know when you prepare for that wedding? Every mass. This is the meaning of the mass now. When you look at what a Catholic wedding is, it's based on the sacrament and the grace of God. Now, in our tradition, who is the groom? Jesus. Who is the bride? The church. Who's the church? We are. We are the bride, male or female. Wait a minute, there's gender confusion, right? We are the bride, male or female. And every mass that you walk up this aisle, you are the bride making your wedding march. Now when you come up this aisle, you are the bride. And in a Catholic wedding, who is waiting for the bride at the altar? The groom. So when you come up this aisle as the bride, who's waiting for you here at the altar? Jesus the groom. And what happens on the wedding night? The groom enters into the bride and gives life. What happens at the mass? You come forward as the bride. The groom enters into you. The groom enters into you physically. Just like the wedding night of the groom and the bride in the marital act, the groom enters into you and it is consummated here in the mass. This is what it is. The mass is this wedding feast of the lamb, as Scott Hong calls it. The mass is something beyond, and we're going to start after the break on the last part of the meaning of the mass, because you know when the mass happens, the church roof opens up, the saints tell us, Pope Benedict tells us, and heaven and earth are united. The angels and the saints ascend and descend together. And heaven and earth are united. Do you know at every mass, your guardian angel comes forward and all of our guardian angels kneel around this altar. And do you know your guardian angel is holding a vessel? All the mystics tell us this. What is in that vessel? What you put into it. Your joys. 
your sorrows, your sufferings, your hopes, your dreams, everything that you are there for, remember the Mass is God offering God to God, all comes from God, all will return to God. At the Mass, you are there as that second part of of God's mercy, redemption, is played out at Calvary. You are there, present at Calvary. And as God offers himself back to the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit, don't miss that boat. Offer up all your prayers, joys, and sufferings with that sacrifice. If I was to ask you what is the high point of the Mass, what would you say? It's not the consecration. Everybody goes, what? It's, yeah, it's, it's united. You really can't separate it, so probably that's not a good statement. But you want to know the high point of the Mass? The high point of the Mass, yes, the consecration is important because Christ prepares the bread and the wine to become his body and blood. But it's not yet consummated with us yet. It's prepared, but at the concluding doxology... Jesus completes that return of us to God the Father. You know what the cluding doxology is? The priest lifting the patent and the chalice through him and with him and in him. O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. That priest is in persona Christi. The only reason he is a man is because Christ was a man. It's not sexism. It's just that that man is in the place of Christ, who was a man, and he's offering that sacrifice back to the Father. That is the high point of the Mass, because it's being consummated. Don't miss that boat. Everything that we give to God is put back on there, on that thing, and our guardian angels come to us. Now, I have a question for you. How many guardian angels you all have? Guess how many I got. Every priest has two guardian angels. Now that's probably because we need them the most. (laughs) And Satan targets the priest, does he not? The Satan targets the priest. You know, the angels... Okay, one of the reasons Satan fell was because he was not going to worship God after he became a lowly man. Who's higher, man or the angels? Ah, right down the middle. Who was created higher? God created us higher than the angels or angels higher than man? Angels are created higher than man. They have a superior intellect. They are not constrained by space and time. They do not suffer like we do. They are superior in creation. By creation, angel is higher than man. But by grace, Man was elevated above the angel by the incarnation, by the immaculate conception. And that is when Satan said, no way, I am not going to bow down. He didn't have so much a problem with God as God was. He had a problem when God said, I'm going to become somebody lower than you. That's humility. And when God said, I'm going to become something lower than you, he said, no way. And how many people or how many angels, as the Bible said, fell from the sky that day? A third, excellent. Why not a half? Why not a a fourth? Why a third? Because tradition tells us that a third of the angels were dedicated to adoring the Father, a third of the angels were dedicated to adoring the Son, and a third of the angels were dedicated to adoring the Holy Spirit. Guess what third fell from the sky? The Son! Because he was going to become this lowly creature, and they said, no way! And they fell. And he took all, Satan took all those angels with him. Those are the demons. They are real. You know what tradition with a small t says when the world will end? Small t tradition now, not church teaching. Small t tradition says the world will end when the number of human souls that enters into heaven will replace the number of angels that fell from the sky that day. That's pretty neat. So be one of those angels. All right? Last thing before our break. What's this? This is an actual picture at the Shrine of Divine Mercy. Isn't that beautiful? I don't know if you can see it. All right? At every Mass, we see Jesus on the cross. But why did Jesus die on the cross? To save us, true, but he could have saved us from heaven. 
Why did Jesus die on the cross? He loves us, true, but he could have loved us from heaven. To forgive our sins, true, but he could have forgiven our sins from heaven. Why did Jesus die on the cross? All those are true. He loves us to forgive us. They're all true. But why? You're forgetting a big one. All right, let's take our break right now. <laughs> and when we come back, we will talk about one of the big reasons why Jesus died on the cross. So let's take a quick break. I'm sorry I'm running behind. Let's stretch. Let's get up. Let's take a five-minute break. Okay, everybody? Thank <laughs> you. 